Hey, what's up, family? Pastor George here, and we are here live at Berean 2023, our last day here. Can you believe it's our yes, last day? Yes, so excited. Berean. Yes. We've had a few days of amazing, impactful, influential, inspirational words coming from a number of different speakers from around the country. And tonight, we have Dr. Marcus Cosby coming to share a word yes. with leaders from around the country, lay people from around the country, and he has a word just for you wherever you are. And so if you're sitting on your couch, mm -hmm. if you're sitting in your cubicle, if you are sitting in a car getting ready for church on your way here, listen, we have a word for you tonight. Yes. Um, as always, we want to uh, shout out all of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. So as we get ready to get into our service, this Berean Conference is sponsored by Logos Bible Software. And so if you are a pastor, you you need logos. We don't mm. want any illiterate, illiterate preachers mm -mm. out here no more. So make sure you get Logos Bible software, get you some commentaries, some Bible dictionaries, learn your books of the Bible and get Logos Bible software. But also we are sponsored by Community for New Directions. Yes. And so we want to say thank you for all of our sponsors, for all of those people who have sold into uh, Berean leadership and into the kingdom of God. And so thank you again for joining us on this last day of the Berean con um, conference. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you've seen um, yes. from some of the members and some of the uh, conference attendees and yes. experience? Yes, so these three days have been amazing. We have had lay leaders and we've had ministers and pastors come in for all of the different sessions that we've been having. Um, and they have been having a great time. Um, today was like really big. They had the prayer this morning and all of these sessions. About mental health. Yes, mental health. And we it, it was just amazing. We've had exhibitors out in the front. Um, and so we want you guys, if you either missed this year or you came this year and it was amazing, we want you to sign up for our early bird special. Actually, it's a super early super, bird. Super early yes, bird. and that is open for 2024 for Berean. So make sure. Um, if you want to join us next year, now is the time to go ahead. Um, we still have time before service starts. Go ahead and register. Um, and that is open for $50 until January 1st. So you have time. Get your friends. For less than a few cups of Starbucks. That's it. Just sacrifice. You, you Just sacrifice. Get, you can get your Berea yes. Leadership yes. Conference stuff for next year. Yes. And so uh, we, want, we want you to do that before you leave. Don't yes. wait till you get home. Don't wait till next week. No sign up for Berean yes. next year. We believe that it's going to be just as amazing and just as powerful as this one. Um, yes. We're getting ready in a minute to go see who is in the lobby. Yes, we who's here? Pastors and leaders coming mm -hmm. from Tennessee and from Arkansas and from California, mm -hmm. from the islands. We have pastors literally coming yes. from the, around the world just to be poured into because we need Jesus too. We need Jesus too. We need too. a touch from the Lord. We yes. need somebody to touch us. But listen now, and listen, we're going live to this. We're not going to the lobby. We're going to the sanctuary. Okay. Because it is time for church. Let's see. And so get your get your meal ready. Get your fruit punch. Mm -hmm. get, get ready and get settled because we're about to go into church.
Well, to God be the glory for the great things our God has done. Our God is great and greatly to be praised. And on this Friday night, we may as well give God the glory that is due unto his name. Will you help me celebrate God on a Friday night? Help me celebrate God who is most worthy to be praised. How we praise the Lord for his darling son, Jesus, who still remains the light of the world. And how we bless the Lord for his precious Holy Spirit, who indwells and empowers us and enables us to follow the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good for us to be here. And how we celebrate God tonight for this wonderful privilege to be with the Berean Fellowship in this place. And how we celebrate the one who gives leadership both to the First Church and to the Berean Fellowship. His Grace, the Honorable Bishop Timothy J. Clark. God bless you, sir. God bless you. How we praise God for you. There are very few people who are such a gem of a gentleman as he. And I thank God for him, for our fellowship, our friendship, our brotherhood across the years. And I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to gather with the people of God in this space tonight. To the Collegium of Bishops, I praise God for each one of you and to all the cadre of clergy who gather in this place tonight. And to those who walk by faith and not by sight, it is good for us to be here. I thank God for this wonderful woman of God who stands behind, beside the bishop in marriage and in ministry. Will you help me celebrate this leading lady today? God bless you, Lady Clark. Love you, ma'am. Praise God for you. To the entirety of the Clark family, God bless you one and all. And to this magnificent music ministry that has blessed us tonight, thank you so much. Amen. We were watching church as we were making our way here, and I saw how the bishop was slow walking and making sure that he could just add whatever kind of announcement in he could to make it look like everything was going all right. But I thank you so much for extending the service just a bit so we could get here. I wanted to be here tonight, and I'm grateful for the privilege of being with the Berean family. Amen. Delighted to have with me the executive pastor of our church, Reverend Alexander E.M. Johnson. He, he gives leadership to our church in phenomenal ways. Yeah. He runs everything. He just tells me to get up on Sunday and talk. And so I'm grateful that he gives me that privilege. Thank you so much, sir, for letting me do what I do while you do everything else. Amen. Praise God for the Reverend Johnson. Delighted to have my son-in-law in the house tonight, the Reverend Dr. Micah Gaines. God bless you, sir. It's good to see you. Praise God for your presence tonight. Amen. It is good for us to be here. I have heard by the hearing of the ear who has been in this place to preach over these last two nights. And I almost did not get off the plane when I heard about it. Dr. Carolyn Ann Knight is one of God's gifts to the body of Christ. And I thank God for her. She's my sister for real and I thank God for her. And then last night, Dr. Charlie Dates, and what a blessing Dr. Dates is every time he stands up. Every time he stands up. So I'm going to read my little ABCs, and I'm going to move on and get out of your way. But there is a word from the Lord tonight. And if you have your Bibles, I invite your attention to the New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke. The New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke at chapter 17. As we continue with this, conclude, I suspect, with this leadership conference. Let's turn our attention to Luke chapter 17. We'll begin our reading at verse 5. <coughs> the New Testament gospel as recorded by the writer Luke at chapter 17. We'll begin our reading at verse 5. I'm reading tonight from the New International Version of the Holy Word of God, and this is what it says. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. You may be seated in the presence of our good and gracious God. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk from the subject, increase our faith. I suspect it should be, could be said, must be said, that every one of us tonight could, should make the same request of the Lord that the apostles made that day. 
Every one of us needs the Lord to increase our faith. Despite your church position or church tradition, every one of us tonight needs the Lord to increase our faith. Really doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Doesn't matter how long you've been serving. Doesn't matter how spiritual you profess to be. Every one of us tonight needs the Lord to increase our faith. I know you know the books of the Bible. I know you've been serving the Lord with gladness for an extended period of time. But every one of us listening to me tonight needs the Lord to increase our faith. I know, I know you can quote the scriptures. As a matter of fact, you pray three times a day toward the east. But every one of us tonight needs the Lord to increase our faith. I suspect tonight that whatever is our relationship with God, all of us can come up on some moments in time where the faith that we thought we had can get shaken, can get disturbed, can get frustrated, and we need the Lord <laughs> to increase our faith. If we live long enough, someone can testify you'll run up on something you never expected, never anticipated, and it will cause you to beg of the Lord to increase your faith. It's reminiscent of that father in Mark chapter 9 who brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples. The disciples could not cure him, could not do anything about him. That demon would cause that boy to seize He'd throw him into the fire and into the water, and he could not get a hold of himself. The disciples couldn't do anything about that son, but by the time Jesus came down off the Mount of Transfiguration, he brought his son to Jesus. And uh, Jesus says, do you believe that I can do this? You all remember what that father said. He said, Lord, I believe, but I need you to help my unbelief. Can it be said of all of us tonight that we have those points in our relationship with God that we can easily say, Lord, I believe. But haven't you had that moment in life where you had to say, Lord, help my unbelief? <laughs> All of us tonight may as well testify <laughs> that there come some moments in our lives when we need the Lord to increase our faith. I grew up at Emmanuel Baptist Church, 8301 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, where Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry was my pastor. And every Sunday morning that the Lord sent, we sang four hymns in morning worship. Every Sunday morning that the Lord sent, we sang four hymns in worship. We sang what was known as the introit hymn, the congregational hymn, the invitational hymn, that was follow what that that came before the sermonic hymn that came after the sermonic hymn. We sang all four of those hymns every single Sunday, and we sang every verse of every hymn. Every stanza that was written, Pastor Curry said, if the writer didn't want you to sing the song, he wouldn't have written the whole song. And so we sang every stanza. One of those hymns that I learned back there, Bishop Clark, went a little something like this: "Tis so sweet." To trust in Jesus, <clears throat> just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, here it is, oh for grace. To trust him more. <laughs> Is there anybody in church tonight who can testify? That's your prayer tonight. I need the grace to trust God more. I need the grace to trust God more at the church where I serve. I need the grace to trust God more in this family I'm in. I need the grace to trust God more in my health, on my, in my finances, on my job. I need the grace to trust God more. Well, tonight, brothers and sisters, as we have come to this common ground on the need for increased faith, meet me in Luke chapter 17, because it seems to me that the Lord Jesus has decided to share with his disciples some information that was necessary for their development. You must understand the context out of which the text comes, because the Lord Jesus is making his way inexorably toward the holy city of Jerusalem. 
He's making his way to be sure for the very last time. He's making his way to celebrate the Passover with all the pious and devout Jews. And once he celebrates the Passover, he's going to give his life as a ransom for many. He's going to die on that Friday and triumphantly be raised to life on that Sunday. But while he's going, as he's walking with his disciples, he wants to make sure they have some information that's going to help them to carry out the leadership responsibilities that will be necessary for this next level of ministry. He says, I'm about to take you to another level now. And you won't always have me to lean on in the physical. And so you're going to have to know some things that are going to help you give leadership, not just to this ministry, but to the next movement that's on the way. And so the Lord Jesus Christ gives to them, Bishop Binion, what could arguably be called the most difficult lesson in discipleship. While he's on his way, moving toward Jerusalem, the Lord gives his disciples, these apostles, a lesson in forgiveness. He wants them to understand the significance of forgiveness in the life of the believer. And so he gives to them a little, little interesting information. He says, listen here, if, if someone offends you seven times in one day and they ask for your forgiveness, they repent, your responsibility is to forgive them every time. I had three people say amen over here. One person raised his hand. Other folks said, help me, Jesus. I understand because this is a difficult lesson in discipleship. Listen again to what Jesus says. If the same person offends you seven times in the same day, your responsibility when they repent is to forgive. Now, this is intriguing, isn't it? Because most of us say, hold on, Mr. Jesus. I get it with uh, seven times in a lifetime. I could probably go with seven times in a year. But seven times in one day? Jesus says your responsibility, if they offend you seven times in one day and they repent every time, your task is to forgive them. That's verse number four in Luke chapter 17. Verse number five goes like this. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Yeah. If we're going to do that, we're going to need you to increase our faith. Can I find six people who with the disciples on this Friday night? You can testify. If the Lord's going to make that kind of discipleship demand on me, I need him to increase my faith. And so when you walk through chapters 17 and 18 of the Gospel of Luke, it seems to me that the Lord lifts up three snapshots, three portraits of faith that just might help us on this Friday night. As we seek to give the leadership we've been called to provide. That the Lord is calling us to make sure that we uh, do for this present age what is necessary to help them move to the next level of discipleship. We've got to give leadership in a way that shows that we've been with Jesus. <laughs> I said we've got to give leadership in a way that shows, demonstrates, displays that you and I have been with Jesus. And so watch Jesus as he gives these portraits, these snapshots. The first one comes in verse 11 because when you jump down to verse 11 in Luke chapter 17, you'll find out that there are 10 men who are lepers. Your Bible says they are lepers. And these 10 men who are supposed to be the outcasts of the community. Uh, have dealt with this horrific skin disease that is manifested by white patches all over their bodies. These brothers have to deal with the reality that as a consequence of advanced leprosy, appendages fall from the body. As a consequence of the progressive nature of leprosy, their voices get muted and you can barely hear them above a whisper. Here these brothers are, ten men who are not supposed to be in the populace of the community. They're outcast church family. They, they are supposed to be on the outskirts, on the periphery of the community. They are, to be sure, the pariah of the community. And these 10 men heard that the Lord Jesus was passing by. And they said, we need to seize this moment. 
because we recognize that that man named Jesus can do more for us than we can do for ourselves. And although we're supposed to be outcasts, although we're not supposed to be in the community proper, I think we need to take advantage of a moment. And may I suggest that these ten men show us, brothers and sisters, that you and I have to have faith, watch this, despite the severity of our predicament. Oh, can I give you that one just again? Because first little point of this three-point message is that God expects that you and I will have faith. Somebody shout faith despite the severity of our predicament. I don't know if you heard, but these 10 men have leprosy. It's a highly contagious skin disease manifested by white patches all over your body. If the disease progresses or advances far enough, appendages fall from your body. Your voice gets muted. You can barely hear it above a whisper. You're supposed to be in a, a, a colony. You're supposed to be away from everybody who's near and dear to you, detached by Levitical law from everybody you know and love. Ah, but some kind of way, they heard that Jesus was passing by. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, listen to what these ten men do. They take their collective ten voices, and they raise them as far as they can. And they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. Don't miss it, church family. They say, Jesus, master, have mercy, have pity on us. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus begins to have communication with these brothers. Now, this doesn't happen very regularly because they're outcasts. So very few people want to have communication with them. But Jesus begins to talk to them. But what he says is intriguing. He says to them after they have made their request of him, he says to them, go show yourselves to the priest. Hold up. Wait a minute. Flag on the play. Something's not right, Brother Jesus. I, I thought for sure you would do one of those Jesus-y things. You know, Jesus, when you get ready to heal, you'll put your hands on folk. You'll tell them to go wash in the pool of Siloam. You'll spit and make mud. You'll do those phenomenal things. I thought for sure that when we came to you, we were going to see some bells and whistles ringing or some lightning and thunder. And all you have to say is go show yourself to the priest. Come on, Jesus. Surely you could have at least said, be thou clean. <laughs> he says none of that. He says go show yourself to the priest. Could it be, child of God, that every now and then the Lord wants to see, do we have enough determination? Do we have enough faith to walk on a word? Oh, let's talk about it for a little while because most of us want to see the phenomenal and the fantastic. Most of us want to see the lights, camera, and action. Most of us want to hear the bells and whistles, but every now and then, God simply says, can you take me at my word? Can you trust me and walk on a word? Last time I checked your Bible, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And is there anybody who still believes that one word from the Lord can literally change the trajectory of your life? Can I get seven people right around in here who can testify? I still need a word from the Lord that will help me understand that I can hold on till times get better. Is there a witness in here that despite how severe my predicament, if the Lord speaks a word in my life, everything can be turned around. There he is challenging them to walk on the word. He does not touch them. He does not speak a word of healing to them. He sends them toward the priest. And the Bible says that while they're walking, something starts shifting. While they're walking, something starts changing. While they're walking, their strength starts coming back. While they're walking, their skin starts clearing up. While they're walking, <clears throat> let me clear my throat, their voice starts coming back. While they're walking, 
Oh, I need to find the folk in here who every now and then have had to just take God at his word. And while you've been walking, you've seen God turn things around. Somebody ought to testify his word still works. They're walking. And while they're walking, they feel something. They sense something. They experience something. And there's one of them in the group who says, hold up. Wait a minute. I can't keep going that way. But that man Jesus just did something for me that nobody else could have done. He turned himself around, went back to Jesus, fell at his feet, started praising God. And that Samaritan said, Lord, I just want to say thank you. I wonder if I got somebody in Berea tonight who can testify after all the Lord has done for you. You can't keep going your way when you see how he's made a way. I need somebody to testify every now and then. I just got to stop and tell him thank you. I wish I'd find somebody in here that the Lord has done something for you this week that nobody else could have done. And for the next 10 seconds, will you open up your saved mouth and tell your God thank you? For every mountain, you brought me over. For every valley, you've seen me through. For every blessing, hallelujah. For this I give him praise. There he is, falling at the feet of Jesus, telling the Lord, thank you. <laughs> Here's a sad believer who will withhold his or her thank you. Here's a sad believer who watched God made a way, make a way, and you can't tell the Lord, thank you. If we just went through the last 30 seconds and you're the only one on your road didn't say thank you, shame on you. But here's the good news about grace. I'm going to give you another chance. If you watched him make a way, if you watched him open doors, if you've seen him provide, if you've experienced his love, let everything that hath breath tell the Lord, thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And watch, watch, watch. Jesus said, uh, didn't I heal ten? Where the other nine? Why is this Samaritan the only one who's got enough faith to come back and tell me thank you? Can't you hear the Samaritan say, Mr. Jesus, I can't, I can't speak for none of them. That ain't none of my business. All I know is what you did for me. And when I think about what you did for me, I got to take some time to give you the glory that you deserve. So now don't look at nobody on your row and what they're doing or not doing. I just need you to remember what he's already done in your life. And tell that man named Jesus, thank you for everything you've done. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Lady Clark, here it is. They, they have a severe predicament. But they got enough faith to believe that no matter how advanced the challenge may be, that man named Jesus is still able to do exceeding. Abundantly, you better help me preach. Above all, I can ask or think. According to the power that is at work within me. Is there anybody in here? You know you got to go back to a severe situation. You got to go back to mounting challenges. But you still believe that he's with you in the midst of your challenge. And he is able to work all things together for your good. Well, that's Luke chapter 17. May I call your attention now to Luke chapter 18. Because it seems to me that when Jesus opens up Luke chapter 18, he gives yet a second snapshot of faith. It's in Luke 18, beginning at verse 1, that Jesus talks to these disciples who are following him heading toward Jerusalem. And listen to what he says. He says, hey, hey, listen, fellas. Men and women ought always pray and not faint. Never give up. 
don't lose heart. Did you catch it? Jesus said, I want you to make sure that if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to have increased faith, part of the process of increased faith is that you learn how to pray and not give up. Uh, now, now I know, I know, I know, this, this is the Berean Fellowship Incorporated, and in this room, we've got the professional Christians. And you don't come to a meeting like this if you're just a Sunday-go-to-meeting kind of person. These here are the professional church people. Uh, y'all, y'all know when to say amen. You know when to look amen. You, you know when to do all the churchy things. And so this is the professional church crowd. And it may seem a bit sophomoric for the preacher to show up and tell you that Jesus said you ought always pray and never give up. But there's somebody who's thought your prayers haven't reached the roof. There's somebody who has been so, so, so frustrated by your own reality that you didn't really, really believe that God was listening when you prayed. I know you teach prayer, but I don't know if you always believe prayer. I know you preach prayer, but I don't know if you always pray like you should. And so Jesus tells the leading apostles, they're about to carry this ministry on into a movement, and he tells them that y'all always pray and not faint. He tells the leadership conference that y'all always pray and never give up. I submit tonight that you and I ought to have faith despite the severity of our predicament. But I likewise submit that you and I ought to have faith, watch this, that is displayed in the strength of our persistence. Uh, Can I work a little harder tonight? I submit that you and I ought to have faith that is displayed in the strength of our persistence. Somebody shout persistence. stick to I refuse to give up. I refuse to relent. I refuse to shrink back. I believe that my prayers are going to matter to God. And so I'll keep on praying till I get an answer. And so to press his point, the Lord gives to them a parable about a widow woman. She's she's a widow woman, and this widow woman, uh, she has an adversary. According to Scripture, she can't get any justice against her adversary. And she goes to an unjust judge. Uh, The judges were supposed to treat the widows with kindness. From the Old Testament, we find out that judges were supposed to take care of those who had no one else to fend for them. So he's supposed to take care of them. The only problem is, if you just heard me, he's an unjust judge. Your Bible says he doesn't care about God or anybody else. Let me try it again. He's an unjust judge. And she keeps coming to him making her request. Only problem is he's acting like he doesn't hear her because he doesn't care about God or anybody else. He's got unjust policies, unjust practices, unjust procedures. He doesn't care about God or anybody else. In my ears, sound like 45, has an unjust character. Doesn't care about God. Or anybody else, excuse me if I offend you, but but when you think about somebody who only cares about himself, how in the world y'all going to let him be president again? Doesn't care about God. Doesn't care about anybody else. And so he turns a deaf ear to her. But she refuses to relent. She refuses to give up. She keeps on pressing her claim. And your Bible says that although he doesn't necessarily want to, because she won't leave him alone, he he goes ahead and grants her the justice that she's seeking. And then Jesus says, if an unjust judge will do that, how much more will your heavenly Father grant justice to those who seek it? Oh, 
child of God, is there anybody in this Lord's house tonight who can testify you've had to call on the Lord a time or two or twelve about the same situation and you found out that if you keep on praying, your God knows how in his own time to work things out so that it gives you the good you desire and the glory he deserves. Can I find somebody in here who can testify he's still a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God? Oh, no, I need to find the prayer warriors now. That's just about 40 of us who are in here representing. I need to find the folk who had to pray about the same thing multiple times to testify he will hear you when you pray. <laughs> Bishop, I don't know who told us that we're not supposed to pray about the same thing multiple times. They told us back in the day you didn't have enough faith if you kept praying the same prayer over and over again. Apparently, you haven't met Jesus. Because on the last night of his life, when the rubber met the road, he prayed like this. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That was the first hour. He went back the second hour. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but the third hour he goes back. He says, Father... If it's possible, anybody in here ever had to pray for your children about the same thing more than once? Anybody ever had to pray about your spouse more than one time? Anybody have to pray about your health multiple times? Your finances multiple times? Your job multiple times? Somebody can testify. You got to pray over and over again. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Anybody in here know our land is sick? With racism and sexism and classism, our world is sick with our children being miseducated. Our world is sick with gun violence running rampant all over this land. Our world is sick. It makes no sense for Berean to meet if you ain't going to pray till something happens. <laughs> Hear the Lord Jesus. He says, ask and it shall be given. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. These Greek scholars over here, they'll tell you that word is in the repetitive tense. It literally means ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Don't you dare stop praying because your faith is displayed in the strength of your persistence. I, uh, I said like this, uh, Several years ago, our church installed a new phone system in our church. Everybody in the church, all the folk who work there, got brand new phones. And uh, they put one in my office. And uh, I'm from the hood, church, so new stuff excites me. Uh, I grew up poor, so you give me something new, I'm going to enjoy it all day long. Yes, I am. So I'm in my office. I'm just touching all the buttons, just all these buttons. I ran across a button leading lady that said, ICM callback. Didn't make any sense to me. It was the three letters, ICM, and then the word callback. I didn't know what it meant. So I called my assistant, Andrea Tucker. I said, Andrea, you got to tell me what does this button do? She said, Pastor, that button is for when you call somebody at the church and they are unable to take your call. They are not yet at the point where they can receive your inquiry. You press that button, and the phone will keep calling them back until they're available to answer. I said, hold up. Wait a minute. Tell me that again. Tell me like I'm a kindergartner. Explain that thing to me. She said, Pastor, if you call somebody at the church, and they are not in the place, the space, they are not available to take your call, you can press that button, and the phone will keep calling the person back until they are ready, available to answer your call. I said, if my phone got enough sense to keep on calling till it gets an answer, how much more should you and I keep on calling 
until we get it. Can I find six people in here who can testify? I refuse to give up on God. I've been walking with him too long now to think he won't respond to me. I refuse to stop calling out to God. He's shown me over and over again that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Is there a witness in this building tonight? Keep on praying, child of God. Keep on praying. Keep on praying for that church. Keep on praying for them children. Keep on praying for that community. Keep on praying for this nation. Keep on praying for the fellowship. Keep on praying till something happens. I've got to close. Bishop Guns would have preached an hour and a half, but I'm going to close right here. That's my friend. I need to close. Watch this, church. Uh, I submit that all of us need to make the same request that the apostles made of the Lord that day. We need to ask the Lord to increase our faith. And you and I need faith despite the severity of our predicament. May I suggest, I tried to suggest, that you and I need faith that is displayed in the strength of our persistence. I close when I tell you that you and I need faith that is determined to see God's power. <laughs> I said you and I need faith. Somebody shout faith. <laughs> that is determined to see God's power. Anybody still want God to show you something? This guy, anybody need God to reveal some things to you? I know we walk by faith and not by sight, but every now and then, God will show you another glimpse of his glory. God will show you another paradigm of his power. Anybody ever seen God show you something that nobody else could have shown you? I, I submit that every now and then we ought to ask the Lord, let us see miracles, signs, and wonders. I don't believe those stopped happening in the Bible. I still believe that miracles, signs, and wonders are available to those of us who believe. Is there a believer in this church? So, so when you drop down to verse 35 of chapter 18, you'll find out that Jesus has now picked up a crowd of brothers and sisters as they're walking. I don't know if you heard. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And uh, while they're walking to Jerusalem, headed toward Jerusalem for the Passover, then Jesus is going to give his life as a ransom for many. While they're going, great crowd, these powers, pious Jews, these devout Jews have now gathered with Jesus. And while they're walking, your Bible says that uh, there's a blind man sitting by the roadside. And he heard that Jesus was passing by. Oh, this is so good to me. Uh, he, he, he's a blind man. But he heard the commotion of the crowd. He asked what's going on. And they tell him that Jesus is passing by. Help me preach, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I am tired. And Jesus is passing by. And while Jesus is passing by, your Bible says that this blind man, we don't know his name from Luke's gospel. We know it from Mark's gospel. At least we know his daddy's name. He's Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And while he's waiting on Jesus to pass by, as Jesus is making his way through that town, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Ooh, I thank God for a Bible reading church. That's what Bereans did. Yeah. Um, uh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's the problem, Bishop. The Bible says that the leaders of the crowd told him to be quiet. Hold up, wait a minute, flag on the play. The leaders of the crowd, the professional church people, those who are already walking closely with Jesus, they have the nerve to tell a man who does not have sight to be quiet. Sit down. Hush up. It don't take all that. 
Only professional church people use that kind of language. Hush! You don't take all that. And the Bible says that when they told him to be quiet, he got louder. That's my brother. My kind of brother. My kind of brother. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. How in the world who are people who already got their sight going to tell the miracle worker not to give a man who does not have his sight the sight that he needs? How dare we stand in the way of people getting what we already got? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says Jesus stood still. Hold up. Hush. Somebody's calling my name. <laughs> and here's the good stuff. The, Jesus then told the people who were trying to shut him up to bring him up. Because he still makes your enemies your footstool. He still makes your haters your elevators. Even if they professional church people, he'll still prepare a table before you. In the presence of your enemy. Bring him to me. And when they brought the man to Jesus, Jesus says, what you want? Okay, that's not how your Bible reads, I know. Your, your Bible does not read what you want. If you got the King James Version, it says, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? <laughs> but don't none of y'all talk like that in here. Most of y'all, if you talk like me, what you want? Making all this noise, doing all this hollering. What do you want? You would think, and it's rightly, rightly uh, understandable, that Jesus knew what he wanted already. But every now and then, the Lord will make you verbalize your request. Do all that hollering, what you want? Let your request be made. Come on and help me preach. Be made known unto God. And the Bible says, he said, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. I want to see God's power. I want to see. I need my eyes to be open. I want to see now on the surface. That sounds good. That's what King James Version says. That's what New International Version says. If you read from the original Greek, You'll find out it's not just say, Lord, I want to see. It says, Lord, I want to see again. You get the inference, don't you? He has seen before. Somewhere along the journey, he lost what he had. And now he's asking the Lord to restore what he once had. And there is somebody in this building tonight who had been hollering out to the Lord ever since you got to church. Because you need God to restore some things in your life that you've lost along the way. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but is there anybody who still believes he's the God of restoration? Is there anybody who still believes he'll restore your joy and restore your peace and restore your sanity and restore your finances and restore your health? I need somebody on a Friday night to open up your mouth and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to see again. I lost it along the way. The pandemic took it away from me. Life has taken it away from me. Circumstances have robbed it of me. I need you to let me see again. And I came tonight to remind you he's still the God of restoration. I don't care how long it's been. I don't care how extended the situation has been. Last time I checked your Bible, he'll restore the years that the locusts have destroyed. Anybody ever been depressed for years and in one word from the Lord changed your depression and gave you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Somebody in here can testify he restoreth my soul. Keeps me alive. He says I want to I want to see again. And the Lord said your faith has made you whole. If you got enough faith to holler out to me like that you got enough faith 
to make your request like that. I've got enough power to give you what you've been seeking. And tonight, my brothers and sisters, we can go back from this place testifying that the God we serve still has power to do amazing things in the lives of those who trust him. I need 10 people in here who can recognize in your own life that the Lord has done some things for you that you never could have done for yourself. Come on, I'm about to close the message, but is there anybody in here who can look back over your life? Come on, man, let's go to E-flat and testify that the Lord has been so good to you. Open doors that you could have never opened for yourself. He even closed some doors you didn't need to go through. And tonight you're a living, breathing testimony that he is able to do what nobody else can do. So tonight I came to help somebody in this sanctuary to go ahead and have the faith that you need to get what you need from the Lord. And the Bible says that when the Lord received his, restored his sight, that man started praising the Lord. Makes sense to me that when the Lord does something for you that you could never have done for yourself, you don't just stand there and act like you did it by yourself. You open up your mouth. You lift up your voice. You throw your head back. You clap your hands. You do your dance. And you start praising God. For the next 30 seconds, I need you to think of one thing that the Lord did for you this week that you could have never done for yourself. And while I'm trying to head toward my seat, I wish you'd begin to praise God with everything that is within you because you recognize that he didn't have to do it, but he did. He didn't have to make a way, but he did. He didn't have to open doors, but he did. He didn't have to pay that bill, but he did. He didn't have to heal your body, but he did. And on a Friday night at the First Church of God, I need the everything that hath breath to help me praise God for being so good to you, for making so many ways for you, for doing for you what you could have never done for yourself. He started praising God. And that makes sense to me. But first lady, that's not the end of the story. That the Bible says that after he started praising God, everybody else started praising God too. I like that church family. If one of us starts praising God, ain't time for you to be looking and wondering what she praising God for. What are you doing all that hollering for? If you can't beat them, you might as well join them. And somebody in here ought to testify. I got to praise God with my sisters and brothers. I got to praise God with the whole family of faith. But what I like about this church, he's not praising God. They are not praising God for what God did for them. They're praising God for what God did for him. And you know you're growing up in your praise when all your praise ain't about you. But you can praise God for what God is doing in somebody else's life. You can praise God for the way God is elevating somebody else. You can praise God for the way God is promoting somebody else. And for the next few seconds, I wish you'd find somebody around you, look at them dead in the face, and say, this praise ain't about me, but this praise is because you still standing. This praise is because you still got joy. This praise is because you haven't gone crazy. This praise is because God is still holding you up and keeping you strong. Is there anybody in this building who can help me praise God? Not for yourself, but for somebody else. Somebody ought to praise God that the bishop looks as good as he does. Somebody ought to praise God that your roommate looks as good as she does. Is there anybody who can help me close and begin to testify? All of my praise ain't about me, but when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for you, my soul cries hallelujah. I want to thank God for pulling you through. Is there anybody who can find somebody and say, thank God that sickness didn't take you out. Thank God those haters didn't take you out. Thank God that church didn't take you out. Thank God you still standing after the pandemic. You caught the virus. 
sickness, but you're still here. You were sick, but you're still here. Is there anybody who can help me preach and testify? I'm praising God because my neighbor survived. I'm praising God because my neighbor is happy. I'm praising God because all things work together for your good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! 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 Yeah! Hallelujah! Give him glory! Give him glory! Yeah! It's a strong faith walker who doesn't always have to praise God about your four and no more. Somebody can look across the room and see that there's somebody in this place tonight who if the enemy had had his way, they wouldn't be standing tonight. But God, well, that's all I got to say about that. That's, that's all I got to say. You ought to be able to shout right about that. But God, anybody got a but God testimony? Anybody know if it had been the other way, things would have gone a whole different way? But God, oh, oh really God. Well, give him a but God praise.
Musicians, just keep playing. Dr. Cosby, stay seated. But take the mic and pray for us. Oh, great God. How we love you and adore you tonight. How we honor you because of your superlative beauty. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're the God who does not change. You're the God on whom we can depend. Tonight we thank you that we have heard your word and we can go back from this place testifying the God we serve will give us the privilege to have our faith increased. Thank you for your word that we've heard each of these nights, each of these days. Thank you that you've continually spoken to us through preacher after preacher, session after session, so we might go back from here better than the way we came. I pray for that preacher now, that pastor, that leader, who's been so consumed by the severity of the predicament that they did not know whether or not you were really going to work it out. I thank you for that preacher, that pastor, that leader who refuses to stop calling on your name in prayer. I thank you for that preacher, that pastor, that leader who is determined to see your power. Show us another glimpse of your glory. Show us that you still have power to do the amazing, to do the phenomenal, to do that which is beyond what we can even imagine in our own mind. We thank you tonight that we've been called together for such a time as this. We thank you that we've been able to hear from you. And now we pray that you'll order our steps as we leave from this place so that we will not just be hearers of your word, but we'll be doers also. Increase our faith. Show us that you're still in control. Show us that you still have power. Show us that there is nothing too hard for you. And we promise we'll give you the glory that's due unto your name. We promise we'll give you the praise because you're worthy of it. We thank you tonight for these who stand around us who, like we, need to have our faith increased. I pray, great God, that we will not leave here the same way we came. Convict us such that we will trust you more in the last several weeks of 2023 than we did in the first several months. Oh God, we're calling on you tonight. We need you to help us lead your people with greater faith. We don't simply want to speak words. We want to speak words that have power, that effectuate change. We want to see you do great and mighty things. We want to see your great exploits in the earth. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, prove to us afresh 
that you're still God all by yourself. Prove to us afresh that you're still in complete control, that you're the sovereign God of glory for whom nothing shall be called impossible. And we promise to trust you. We promise to praise you. We promise to obey you. We promise to serve you henceforth now and forevermore. And we thank you for the victory that is ours because we are yours in the strong name that's above every name, even the name Jesus Christ. We pray this for all. We thank you for the name Jesus. Ah, we thank you that demons still tremble at the name of Jesus. We thank you that mountains still move when our faith is coupled with the power in the name of Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, show us that you're still in control and we'll give you the glory that's due unto your name. For thine is the kingdom. Hey, hey, hey. And the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And all of God's people shout hallelujah. Let the church say amen. amen. Will you clap your hands and give God glory like you know he deserves it. Bless him like it's your last time. Bless him like it's your last time. Come on, bless God one more time. We're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to go. Were you blessed by this word? No, were you blessed by this word? Now I'm going to say this. I don't want anyone to take it any other way. You know how much I love me some John Guns. But it is obvious. God wanted Marcus Cosby here tonight. Now, First Church knows he was just with us a few months ago. And for us to be able to get him back was nothing, Uncle George, Deacon George, our Mary, nothing but the sovereign hand of God. What a word to send us home. It may be that there are those here today, pastors, ministers, who want to become part of Berean. Berean offers three things, covenant, connection, and covering. And if you're here tonight, you've been with us, and you want to make Berean a place where you can share and serve, would you just step out right now? Come, let me greet you and shake your hand. If you're here and you want to be a part of Berean Fellowship of Churches, come on, let's thank God.